If you've never played Mega Man Battle Network before and are picking out the Legacy Collection, congratulations! You've made the correct decision! And if you want more Battle Network content, be sure to slap that subscribe button on your PET screen right now. I've got a few more videos cooking. These games are very unique and deep mechanically. Given that, there are all sorts of little tricks, gimmicks, and best practices that the game leaves you to figure out for yourself. Now, if you were 10 years old, Britney Spears hadn't even released Toxic yet, and Battle Network 3 Blue was the only GBA game you were going to get for the next 3 months, spending dozens of hours in-game and on GameFAQs to figure out all of that was a feature, not a bug. But 20 years later, I've seen a lot of people get frustrated and drop these games quickly, which is a golly gosh dang shame because I maintain that they are some of the finest ever published. So today, we're gonna try and stop that from happening. And of course, this collection does afford the options of using Buster Max mode, patch cards, and download chips to blaze right through anything you might get stuck on. But I say there's still good reason to play them as originally intended so that you can appreciate the game design and challenge that Capcom gave us in the early aughts. I'm not the Grand Arbiter of Battle Network, though, so don't let me dissuade you from playing the games the way you enjoy them. But maybe something in here will help you have a good time. And Capcom, if you're ever hiring for that Arbiter position, my DMs are open. I'm Levin Setti, and these are 7 key tips that I hope can help you maximize your enjoyment of the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection. Number 1. Save a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Being RPG-adjacent games originally released on a handheld, the Battle Network series lets you save the game pretty much anywhere as long as you aren't actively in battle. And generally, there's no reason not to take advantage of this. Most of the time, it'll seem like it doesn't really matter, but there's no worse feeling than making a careless mistake and losing hours of progress in the story. Or even worse, the fruits of a lengthy grinding session. As you progress further through each game, enemy navi ghosts become random encounters in a lot of internet areas. Which is the canon in-universe way of saying you can be jump scared by a powerful boss at any time. And look, obviously we're all god gamers here, but sometimes when you're farming for low-level chips, you're just not in the mood or headspace to duel to the death with a version 3 enemy navi. I swear that's the only reason he got me, I, I, I totally could have had it, I just didn't want to win. But it's worth opening that pause menu pretty frequently, so if this happens, you lose 5 minutes instead of 5 hours. And thankfully, you can always turn on some emergency buster mag to get out of a sticky situation if it has been a while. So with that as a baseline, let's talk some more about those god gamer strats. Number 2. Don't rely too too much on the buster. If you're new to Battle Network but not new to Mega Man, you might expect a lot from your buster. After all, the classic Mega Man formula is more or less built on you being able to choose any boss to fight first and being able to trounce them with just that trusty lemon shooter. But Battle Network works a little bit differently and I hate to see people get frustrated and drop the game because it isn't communicated clearly enough. Here's the math behind it. In your standard blue bomber platforming adventure, the average enemy will tend to go down in 5 or fewer buster shots, and the average boss can take somewhere in the realm of 30. In Battle Network, the weakest enemies you're going to run into will take 40 buster shots in the early game, and the bosses will take more like 300. It's a slog at best. So what do we do instead? Rely on battle chips. Even weak early game chips dish out 30 to 60 damage a pop, turning those bosses into 5 to 10 hits instead of 5 minutes with the pea shooter. Mega Man Man.exe doesn't really have lemons. This franchise is designed around relying on battle chips as a key source of damage, unlike the classic series that expects you to fall back on your buster more often than not. That's not to say that you should disregard the buster entirely, it is fun, provides nice chip damage, uh, I, I guess nice non-chip damage? and especially some of the charge shot options you'll have can be very useful. In particular, the original Battle Network is way more buster friendly than the rest of the series, and once you get some upgrades on it, it can outclass a lot of chip options. But in general, it's important to have a strong selection of chips to carry you through fights, and constantly keep updating your folder as you collect more of the things to stay on top of virus encounters. Even if you are using Buster Max, it can be pretty tricky to score double and triple deletes against viruses with that. We'll talk about why that's so important a bit later. And I'd say that collecting and trying out new attacks is always one of the most fun parts of Battle Network, too. Which brings us right to... Number 3. Let your folder flow like water. So battle chips are better than the buster because they do more damage. That means the best way to build a folder is to slap together your highest damage chips, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. See, in a single turn, you can choose up to 5 chips to use, but only if they have matching names or codes. 
It's very tempting to stack your folder to the sky with the highest damage numbers you can find, but being limited to a single 80 damage attack for a full turn can actually end up feeling pretty limiting. A turn lasts 8 full seconds, so having one strong move to take on 2 or 3 viruses is not actually super advantageous, especially if you miss that one attack. Having 3 or 4 shots at 40 or 50 damage instead leaves you less stranded if you miss a chip, better set up to handle multiple targets, and it also helps you move through your folder more quickly. Every chip you use in one turn will be replaced by a new chip in the custom window next time, so if there is a particularly powerful navi chip or combo you want to draw, it's more likely you'll get to it quicker if your folder doesn't have too many different codes clogging things up. Personally, I like to get my folder down to a single code as quickly as I can so that I can always have the option to take 5 chips with me, but that's often unnecessary and does lead me to leave plenty of powerful options in my pack outside my folder. If you can limit what you're running to 2 or 3 codes, you'll blaze through tons of fights and have a ball doing it. Putting together combos despite RNG trying its best to keep you down is one of the most satisfying things in this franchise. And it's never a bad idea to slide in a powerful screen clearing type mega or giga chip even if it doesn't match your codes. Keep in mind that in all games other than the first, there's the star code too, which can be selected alongside any code, making things a lot more simple and clean. Which segues nicely into number 4. Support chips are really, really strong. Just like how Pokemon pros and Nuzlocke experts know the power of support moves, supportive battle chips in Battle Network are just as important and strong. And they come in all sorts of delicious flavors. Invis, Area Grab, Attack Plus 10, just to name a few. They might not seem all that powerful at first, but they do so much work in a folder. Why stress over dodging enemy attacks when you can just have Invis, Mole, or even something like Guard active to do that work for you while you focus on lining up attacks of your own? Something like Area Grab or Crackout can modify the field, making it easier to lock down the enemy and nail them with something spicy, or limiting the ways they can approach and deal damage to you. The damage of multi-hit chips goes through the roof quickly when you start slapping on damage modifiers. There are even things you wouldn't expect, like Blinder in Battle Network 4 and 5 affecting enemy AI, and also taking enemy navvies out of the invulnerable invis status, so you don't have to wait out the iframes to smack them a second time. And so many of these supportive chips are available in the star code, or other powerful letter options, which makes it a no-brainer to pad your folder out with them so you can make the most of every turn. Even if they don't sound the most impressive by themselves, support chips are always worth having on hand and can save you a ton of headaches. Even if you've got Buster Max mode turned on, good support still helps. It's never a bad thing to have a lot of support options, which is why we need to talk about Number 5. Be wary of the chip traders. Every Mega Man.exe adventure features chip traders, where degenerate gamblers like myself can scratch that gotcha game itch in a surprisingly safe and controlled environment. I mean, where you can throw away a few chips you aren't using and get a random chip back. And these are a great, useful, and most importantly, fun tool. You'll inevitably end up with a surplus of, say, guard, cannon, crackout, and so on in the early game, way more than you can fit in a folder, and probably not stuff you'll be using come endgame. So it's cool that there's a use for what could have been junk, and this can even help you complete your chip library and get your mitts on some fun chips or rare codes that you wouldn't otherwise have access to until later in the game, if at all. Some codes are trader exclusive in some games, but once you put something into the chip trader, there is no way to get it back. This is important because each game features some chips that are limited in their availability. I think the most famous example might be Area Grab Star in Battle Network 3, where an early net dealer will sell 1-3 to three copies depending on the version you're playing, and you can't get any more of them than that. This is one of the most useful utility options in the game, and if you happen to carelessly chip trade it away, the only way you can get more is by wiping your save and starting a new file. And the crazy thing is that might actually be worth it. Or maybe you can con someone out of their copies in an online trade if your conscience can handle it. Some installments also feature an in-game trading sequence, not unlike what you might find in some Zelda games, where you trade a chip to an NPC who will give you a chip that just so happens to be what another NPC is looking for, and so on. There are often rare chips and codes involved in these, so if you accidentally offload a trade sequence chip, no matter how useless it might seem, 
you could be making it way more difficult to complete your library or locking yourself out of getting something special. And in all games other than the first, every time you use the chip trader, the game will autosave, so be wary of that too. There's really no undoing the havoc these things can wreak. So I recommend only putting things in the chip trader that you either know are farmable, like drops of common viruses, or things you already have a complete set of. If you're only allowed 4 copies of Invis in your folder, you don't need 12 of those bad boys. But these kinds of limitations vary depending on which entry you're playing, so pay attention to that. And speaking of chip drops, let's talk about the big one. Number 6. Understanding Busting Level Busting level is never very well explained in any of these games, yet is one of the most important aspects of every Battle Network entry. Busting level will determine what rewards you earn from almost every encounter in the game. With viruses, typically a level of 5 or higher can earn you a battle chip, but exactly what chip that is will vary with what specific level you earn. For instance, in Battle Network 2, your typical Metar will drop Guard Star at around a 5 or 6 busting level, but will drop Shockwave R at an 8 or 9, and Shockwave J at an S. So it's worth testing out different ranks against viruses to see what different chips and codes you can earn. Similarly, with navvies, the only way to get their highest level chips is to really style on them with a rank of 9 or higher against their version 3 encounter. Typically a version 1 navvy is fought during the story, a version 2 is a fixed encounter in a specific spot on the net that will always drop their basic navvy chip, and then the third version is a random encounter somewhere that you have to put in an impressive performance against to earn the higher level chips. So how do we guarantee those good ranks? Well, it's different between viruses and navvies. Navvies are a little simpler, so we'll start there. To get an S rank, you need to finish in under 30 seconds without getting hit. It's that simple. As the timer goes further or you start catching shots, you'll gradually lose points. So sometimes if you're targeting a version 2 chip in Battle Network 1, 2, or 3, you might need to intentionally take damage or stall to get that perfect 8 rank. Against viruses, things are a little more complicated. Time and not getting hit are still factors, but there's also movement and multiple deletions to consider. To earn an S rank, you have to finish in under 5 seconds, move less than twice in your area, not get hit, and delete two enemies at the same time. If you can score an elusive triple delete, that's actually worth enough bonus points to get away with messing up the other criteria a little bit. And just like with navvies, missing any of those goals will start dropping your rank. Without a multiple delete, you can't score higher than a busting level 9. If you take 3 steps but get everything else, you'll finish with a 10. There is hard math behind it all, but I think having a general understanding of how busting level works is probably more useful and easier to fit in this video. And things are a little different in Battle Network 6, where scoring counter hits and not using crosses can add to your rating. There's a link in the description with the full details on everything if you're curious. And if there's a certain encounter you just can't quite crack, here's a hot tip. The game only counts getting hit when Mega Man does the flinching animation. So if you have super armor, like through Battle Network 2 Gut Style, a Navi Customizer part, or G-Beast in Battle Network 6, you can shrug off damage without losing any rank, which can be a lifesaver against some tricky bosses. Battle Network 3 specifically has some extra, extra secret busting ranks. In Team Style, defeating a Navi at rank S in under 20 seconds will yield a version 4 chip instead of version 3. Defeating certain viruses while in Custom Style with an S rank without using the Buster or Navi chips can drop a different code than a normal S rank, and doing the same thing while also opening the Custom window a second time can earn you yet another different code. Whew. Too much information for you? Let's end on an easy one. Number 7. Don't do dark chips, kids. Dark chips appear in Battle Network 4 and 5 as a pretty large part of the plot, but their implementation as a game mechanic tends to not quite hit. Their biggest problem is that every time you use a dark chip, it costs 1 HP off your total max HP that you can never recover. There are a limited number of HP memories to increase the stat in each game, maxing out at 1000 hit points before Navi customizer parts and patch cards. So relying on dark chips can really impact your save file irrecoverably in a way nothing else does. In Battle Network 4, they're designed as a comeback mechanic to get you out of sticky situations, only available in the anxious emotion, which is usually brought on by getting kinda whooped. In a game where you can save and reload infinitely and easily, it's just not really worth it. 
Plus, they can't be selected alongside normal chips, and they cause unpleasant bugs as side effects when you do take them. And there's a bit more to it than just whether or not you get to use dark chips themselves. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, blah blah blah. There's a whole karma system where Mega Man can become light or dark, and there are certain chips that are only usable if you're on a particular end of that spectrum, as well as double soul and full sync status being unique to light. And there are a few cool chips that go with the dark alignment. Static and Blackwing in particular are really neat, even though I've never gone to the dark side myself to experience them. But the light side chips are generally more appealing. In particular, Battle Network 4's Holy Dream Giga Chip is one of my favorites in the whole series. And Light Mega Man also gets full synchro for free a lot of the time, which is an incredible boon. Getting double damage on an attack for no reason is not to be underestimated. And then in Battle Network 5, they changed the way Dark Chips work, not forcing the anxious emotion anymore, and allowing you to take advantage of their effects without suffering their consequences through the Chaos Unison mechanic. So you can reap the benefits without losing max HP or going to the Dark Alignment. So using Dark Chips straight up in that game is kinda just throwing away stats for fun. Now, once again, I'm not the fun police. Please play the game however makes you happy. But if you find yourself getting stuck, frustrated, or bored, I hope these tips can help you a little bit. Was there anything in here you didn't already know? Or anything important that I left out? Let me know down below in a comment. And remember, hitting like and subscribe is a combo that doesn't cost any HP at all. Thank you for watching, and I've got more Battle Network content coming soon, so till then.